Are you looking through the menu? Yes. Oh, okay. Here you go. I'm unmuting the back. What? Yeah, it's saying internet. It's got Are internet. you back? Yeah, I'm back on. Yeah, it's internet problems. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Technology at its best. <laughs> I'm not there. <laughs> You're not there. Do you want to come on here then? Yeah, I'll come over to that. We have to uh, pick one over, do it. But there we go. Hang on, we're just swapping. We'll see if I can get it. I'll just unmute, unmute this one. Okay, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Um, yes, yeah, sorry about that. We have internet connection problems. I'll just switch down to that. The other computer's not back on. So, uh, where were we? Yes, um, if you buy in the Campo, then you will probably have a very large um, plot, very large. In um, Alicante, that plot is often 10,000 square meters, which is um, around four acres. In Mercia, it could be 20,000. If you buy in a town, the chances are you're not gonna have much of a garden because traditionally the Spanish don't build houses with large gardens, etc. They tend to build them uh, with very small gardens in the towns. And a lot of Spanish live in apartment blocks with just a very, very small balcony um, because they socialize in the streets. They socialize in the squares, in the bars, in the cafes. So people often say, oh, well, I'd like a house in town with a garden. Uh, in terms that Northern Europeans think of a garden, you're unlikely to find one. You will occasionally in some towns, but the vast majority of properties in town have courtyards, not gardens, in the traditional sense of being able to grow veg veggies and flowers and have lawns. That's property outside the town. The closer you are to the coast, generally speaking, the more you're going to pay for the same property. So the same style property within walking distance of a beach will be considerably more than a property that's 20 minutes drive away from a beach. And that's pure, um, purely sort of supply demand. Obviously, there is a limit to the number of properties that are going to be walking distance to a beach, and they are the ones most in demand. Older properties in Spain, um, really old thinkers are built with sort of like thick, thick walls. I'm talking sort of 30 to 60 centimetres thick. And they are brilliant at being kept warm in winter with a wood burner, um, cool in summer because they have very small windows. Um, with uh, properties built in the late 20th century, can you mute that one? Can you mute it? Sorry. With properties built in the late 20th century, um, you do get uh, very thin walls and property tend to. Um, have very poor insulation. Hang on, man. I'll just switch to here. Hang on. Mm. Right. Sorry, just uh, as I said, we lost the connection and that messed up the two computers, the link between the two. So insulation in um, properties, particularly built in the 80s and 90s, is very, very poor in Spain. And you do need insulation in winter. You do need heating. Um, away from the coast, the temperature is very cold. If you're close to the coast, anywhere um, from halfway down, if you like, the east coast of Spain, around the southeast, um, coastal area onto the south coast, the, the winters are mild, but you still do need heating in the evenings and at night. Having said that, South Costa Blanca and the Mar Menor area of Murcia do have the mildest winters of anywhere in Spain. And they are the only areas close to the beach where you're unlikely to get um, frost and even less likely to get snow. 
I think uh, where our house is in Playa Flamenca, snow happened uh, about four years ago, four winters ago, and it was the first snow in 130 years. So uh, I can cope with half a day's snow once every 130 years. That's fine. We've got friends who live an hour's drive inland and every year they get two, three foot of snow. Um, so, you know, as soon as you go inland in Spain, you're going up into the mountains. The higher, obviously, you go into the mountains, the more snow you're going to get. So if you're looking for the warmer winters, you need to be in the southern half of Spain and you need to be near the coast. Otherwise, it will be very cold. Interesting, the difference between North Costa Blanca and South Costa Blanca. North Costa Blanca is much more mountainous. Mountains come right to the edge of the sea there. Stunning cliffs, um, very rugged mountains. Further north around Valencia, it's more rolling hills, but uh, stunning, very rugged mountains in North Costa Blanca. The result is in the winter, um, we used to drive between my house and, uh, and my parents' house, and the temperature would drop four or five degrees in that two hour drive between the two houses. It's a significant difference in the low lying areas around the south coast of Blanca and the Mar Menor to the more rugged mountainous areas. And my parents were in sight of the sea. Um, so heating, very definitely a requirement. South coast of Blanca, Mar Menor area, you'll probably get away with just having electric heating, um, hot, cold air con, keep your air con on hot through the winter. You still get glorious afternoons, even at this time of year. The temperature in February can be up in the late teens. If you're sitting in the sun, it can even be in the low 20s. But it can also be blowing a gale and pouring with rain, as it was at one point last week. And then you really do need your heating. A lot of people, when they buy a second home, are looking at that home as a potential income generator as well. If you are looking at a property to uh, have as a second home and you think, well, I'd like to rent it out in the summer months, 10 years ago, you could get away with that. You could get away with just buying it and advertising it without any problem at all. In 2015, the law changed and all properties that are let, let out, even on a private basis, are required to have a tourism license. And that is throughout Spain. Now, again, the rules are completely different from one region to another because the qualification for our holiday let and the process of obtaining the license are left to the regional government, not national, but it is a requirement throughout Spain. In the Valencia region in 2018, they really did clamp down. So um, all properties now that are let out um, Murcia has since clamped down as well, that are let out without a tourist license, if you are caught doing so, the fines are very heavy, heavy indeed. You're not talking about a few hundred or a few thousand, you can actually be talking of tens of thousands of euros. So please do not rent out a property without a license because you uh, will be caught out. <coughs> as I said, the um, qualifications for a property do vary and that is something that needs to be looked at individually as to where you are buying, as to what the regulations are and how strict they are in that particular area. So if, for instance, one of the rules in Alicante is, relates to the size of the bathroom. Now, it seems you can own a house with a small bathroom and live in it, but you can't holiday in a property with a small bathroom. Makes no sense whatsoever, but it is in the rules. Now, some town halls agree that's a stupid rule and they're happy to override it and will give you a certificate to say you can apply for a license, um, even if you've only got a small shower room. <coughs> However, some town halls will be will just turn around and say, no, the bathroom's too small, you can't, you can't do it. So that's something that is it needs to be taken into account. And that's one of the things that we'd like you to let us know. We will ask, is this just for personal use or are you looking at it with a view to being an income generator? Because if it is, that is something that has to be taken account into account right at the start of the search. Very, very important. 
if you're relocating, then um, you can do that quite obviously. Now, I know some people listening to this will have EU passports um, or they'll have dual national Irish. Um, so even though they're British, they've got an Irish passport. In which case, you are covered by the freedom of movement rules, the EU rules. Very, very simple. Maximum stay of 90 days. Anyone visit, if you're staying longer than 90 days, you need to apply for residentia. Um, if you're in the, um, sorry, something's going on behind me. If you're in Britain, however, if you're in Britain, however, we of course now are not part of the EU. So anyone with a British passport is covered by third country national rules. And we can send you the link that you need to do to apply for a visa to move to Spain to apply for residency. Now, that um, is, is quite a complex and expensive process and does require a much higher level of income. So if you have got to nationality Irish or you are lucky enough to have an EU passport, then it's really straightforward, nothing has changed. If you have a British passport, an awful lot has changed and there is a new process and we can send details to those who need it. But the most important thing to remember is the difference between living in Spain and being a legal resident. Now, there's been a lot of talk in the British press about people being forced home, um, home being the UK. Excuse me a sec. Because um, of the fact that they've lived in Spain for years, but they never applied for residency. So they were basically living there illegally. <coughs> So it's very important that you do your paperwork right, because just as it applies for all other countries, you cannot stay in Spain indefinitely without having the correct paperwork. Um, a non-lucrative visa, should you apply for it before you buy the property or afterwards? Well, if you're going to live in Spain, you're going to need somewhere to live. A lot of people buy their house initially as a second home and later relocate to Spain. If you're planning to relocate straight away, an option for you may be to look at renting first, um, but you need a proper rental residential license, a uh, con rental contract, not a holiday let contract. Um, and so you've got a permanent address when you get to Spain. So your non-lucrative visa has to be applied for in your country of residence. Um, that visa is then valid for 90 days. You move to Spain, Spain and you apply for your residency uh, within that 90 days. So you are going to have to have somewhere to live. So do you buy the property before you apply for the visa or do you apply for the visa before you buy the property? That's going to literally come down to your personal circumstances. If you have to sell the UK property to be able to afford to buy a property in Spain, then you're going to need somewhere to live. But at the same time, you don't want to risk being turned down for residency. If So that in that case, I would suggest renting first while you apply for your residency. If, on the other hand, you're looking at buying a second home and moving at a later date, then by all means, go ahead, buy the property now, use it as a second home, maybe license it to get, give you a little income, and when the time comes for you to move out, then you apply for your visa um, and you've got a permanent address already. How will things develop in the years to come? Well, we don't know. At the moment, the UK is out of the single market. Um, maybe it will go back in, maybe it won't. Maybe Spain will change its third country rules for all third countries. Um, I very much doubt if they'll make special allowance for the UK, but there is a chance. So what, as things stand at the moment, the income requirement for a third country national is very approximately €27,000 a year, with an additional 6000 per person for 
So a couple is, 30, is just under 34,000 euros. That's reviewed on an annual basis, but it can be, um, you can use lump sum in the bank to make up the difference between earnings and income to show that how much you've got. So that's something that needs to be sort of discussed. It's still very early days for Brits. Literally no one has done it. Nobody British has actually finished the application if they've started it because it only came in in January. And because of the COVID pandemic, the consulate were not issuing the visas until the borders were open. So we've had no client go through the process. Nobody in the UK, UK residents have currently gone through that process. So there's a lot to learn. We know the theory. We don't have the practice. Nobody has. However, Spain is very practiced in it because they've had third country nationals moving there for many, many years. For those of you, as I said, who've still got an EU passport or dual, na or dual nationality Irish, if you're British and you can get an Irish passport, it's well worth doing that because the process is much simpler, much quicker, and we all know how it works. So um, that, that, that's very straightforward. Um, NIE, the NIE does not cost 2,000 euros. Um, sorry if I was um, a little bit confusing about that. Your two and a half to 3,000 euros will cover all your convincing and your NIE. Uh, your NIE you can actually obtain for about 10 euros at the Spanish consulate in either London or Edinburgh, or you can wait until you get to Spain and your solicitor will help you get it. Most solicitors charge around 120 for one, 180 to 200 euros for a couple. Um, but it, it's not a fixed amount because like all solicitors, they vary. Uh, but you can do it yourself for 10 euros, but it does involve having a personal trip to either Edinburgh or London, if you're in the UK, or to your nearest British um, Spanish consulate, if you're on the mainland uh, in Europe. So it may actually be financially more viable to wait until you get to Spain to do it if you're nowhere near a consulate. Um, so the, the cost of buying a property, just to reiterate, your solicitor's costs are going to be between two and a half and three thousand to cover everything. But your tax is separate. That's 10 percent of the property value if you're buying in uh Alicante, 8% of the property value if you're buying in Murcia, 10% if you are buying a new build, no matter where you are buying. Can you get a mortgage in Spain? Yes, you can still get mortgages in Spain. Um, if you're an EU national, most of the time you can get up to 70%. If you're a third country national, it tends to be 60%. Uh, can you borrow towards the cost of purchase? No, I'm very sorry, you can't. That has to be money in the bank that you pay for. There are a few exceptions um, with bank repossessions where you can get a much higher percentage mortgage, but bank repossessions come with their own problems. I will say that now. There are properties that have either been built for many years and never sold, or there are properties that have been empty for many years. Bear in mind that if it's on the open market as a bank repossession, there'll be a reason why the bank's long list of investors have turned it down. So it may be that it's bad position property, it may be that it needs too much work, it may be that, particularly with the golf properties, there are literally hundreds of them. And so there's no, um, you're not going to make money on it. If you buy it, it's a long-term investment, particularly on the golf course. And the fees for owning a property on the golf course are very, very high, community fees. If you buy a standalone villa in Spain, the cost of owning it will be the cost of running your property plus your EB. Now your EB is the UK account equivalent is council tax but it's a tax that's paid to the local council for local services. Now it's actually relatively small on a three bed um, semi detached on a community along the coast that this is likely to be between 250 and 300 euros a year for the property. Now compare that, I don't know what 
council taxes are like in other countries in Europe, but certainly in the UK, you can be paying a couple of hundred pound a month. Um, so it is, it, it's so much smaller. You will also pay a contribution towards your rubbish collection, usually around 60 to 80 euros a year, and the bins are emptied every single day. Uh, and that may be a bill you pay at the same time as your EB, or it may be added to your water bill. Now, I'm not quite sure why some regions and some areas do that. Um, certainly in Orihuela Costa, the cost of emptying your bin, bins is included in the standing charge for your water. Just one of those idiosyncrasies you just have to go with. Uh, but the important thing is to stress that this is not a huge amount. Your utilities, um, you're going to pay a standing charge for electricity and a standing charge for mains water and sewerage. The rest is metered. Many areas of Spain now do have mains natural gas, mains gas. Uh, so again, there'd be a standing charge. But there are also many areas which don't have mains gas. So bottled gas is perfectly uh, normal. And the government do limit the cost that you have to pay for a bottle of gas. So, <clears throat> excuse me, in Spain, you will pay, I'm not sure exactly what the going rate is at the moment, but it's going to be under 18 euros for um, a bottle of gas. The same bottle of gas in the UK is going to cost twice that. So it, it, it's not expensive. Your utilities are more expensive than they used to be, but compared to other countries, Electricity and water is, is um, pretty similar. That's slightly cheaper. Um, the other expense you're going to have, as I did mention, is community fees. If you're on a community, as opposed to having a standalone villa, then you will pay community fees. Now, these could be anything from a couple of hundred euro a year up to about 600 euros a year, unless you're on a golf course. If you're on a golf course, it's going to be well into four figures. Um, over 100 euros a month as a general rule. There are always the exceptions, but just as a general rule. So if you may look at a property on a golf course and think, oh, that's nice and cheap, I can afford a really, really nice apartment on a golf course, look at your monthly outgoings because it's not always the bargain it first seems. Euro rate. Obviously, if you are living in a country in already in the Eurozone, exchange rates are something you don't have to worry about. If you live in a country outside the Eurozone, then obviously exchange rates fluctuate and how much your property is going to cost will change in terms of running costs. Years ago, um, I can only talk from Sterling's point of view, when the Euro first came out, Sterling was about 165 euros to the pound. Um, by 2006, 2005, 2006, it was around 150 and it slowly dropped. And then 2008 happened and the bottom fell out and you were looking at parity. Currently, the sterling euro rate is on its way up. And I think yesterday's rate was, official rate was 116. So it's going in the right direction, but got a long way to go. It's something that um, you do need to factor in is the change in the, is that the changes in exchange rate. And it is very difficult to factor in. We, when we bought, allowed for a 10% drop. And I was actually laughed at because we did all our calculations on 10% less than the exchange rate was at the time and got told, oh, never go that low. Then 2008 happened. Very, very difficult for those living over there who had incomes coming in from other countries and were getting very poor exchange rates. Didn't just affect the Brits, it affected other non-Eurozone countries too. Someone's put about communal pools are being open only from June to September. Last year they were because of COVID. Normally communal pools are open all year round, but they're heated or not, but you won't want to use them when they're not heated. Um, heated ones are open all year round. It does depend on the community. It is the community of owners who set the rules for the community. And it is perfectly normal for communal pools to be open all year round. 
municipal outside pools tend to open the first weekend in June and will close the last weekend in September. Nearly all Spanish towns and villages, larger villages, will have a municipal pool either inside or outside. Um, again, there are exceptions, but most of them do. And they are very cheap for people who live there, usually one euro, one euro fifty per person to go in for as long as you like. So if your property doesn't have a pool, a communal pool, um, which you don't need if you're going to be living there predominantly in the cooler months, then if you are there in the summer, you can use the local municipal pool. But as I said, those are due open June to September only. Uh, but most communal pools are open all year round, but it is down to the individual community to make that decision. And if it's something that as an owner you don't like, it is something you can raise at the annual general meeting of owners. Um, I'm just looking sort of down the questions moment. Do you recommend anybody? Sorry? Do you recommend somebody for euros and stuff? In terms of getting your euros, uh, your whatever currency you have exchanged into euros, um, the best exchange rates are through the exchange rates companies. We can recommend one. We've used them for years. We did get ripped off twice by other companies. So, um, yeah, there are good and bad exchange rate companies. Banks are not always a good idea. Now, one of the problems that has occurred since the UK left the EU is that if you are transferring money from a British account, even if it's a British Euro account, then there are excessive bank charges when the money arrives in Spain. If you use an exchange rate company, not only will you get a better rate of exchange than you would from your bank, but you avoid those charges as well. So come back to us with recommendations on exchange rate uh, and exchange companies for transferring money from whatever currency you are in into euros. Obviously, if you live in the eurozone, then you don't have to worry about things like that. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, moving money around has got slightly more complicated yet again for the British, thanks to Brexit. It has caused a lot of problems, but it doesn't mean you can't buy property in Spain. It doesn't mean that your expenses will be any more to buy the property in Spain. Ah, oh, that does bring me to one thing. With the exception of the fact that if you are buying a property in what is classified as a military zone. Now, this is a very old Spanish law. It goes back to Franco. Um, it's around from my childhood. Um, but when Spain joined the European Union, um, the law no longer applied to any citizen, EU citizens buying in Spain. If you're not an EU citizen and you're buying in Spain, there are areas of Spain uh, and the islands which are classified as military zones. Now, I'm, something we're still learning about because it's something we didn't have to worry about before. Um, the distance, it basically covers any area on the coast within 70 kilometers of a military base, naval or otherwise. So the whole of the Merthian coast is classified, uh, the whole of the Costa Calida as a military zone because of the naval base in Cartagena. It also pulls in the very bottom end, very southern end of the Costa Blanca Alicante region, anything south of Torre Vieja. It covers uh, land up to seven or eight kilometers from the coast and it is purely just a coastal strip. But it means if you are buying property as a third country national in that military zone, you have to get an additional clearance certificate. And as I said, this is a very old law. The Spanish did talk about getting rid of it completely um, or widening the exceptions to all of NATO countries some years ago, but it got sidelined with the change of government, et cetera, et cetera. And right now, Spain, like every other country, has got far more important things to concern themselves about uh, than revisiting archaic um, and inconvenient laws. 
Now, this military certificate is only supposed to take two months to get, but there's a massive backlog because of COVID and they are taking several months. So if you are buying in an area classified as a military zone, which is any land border and any coastal area within 70 kilometers of a, a um, military base, then you will need this certificate and it is a little bit of a path to get. You actually have to already have a contract for purchasing the property before it can be applied for. It's quite a long-winded process. You do part of it in the UK, you do part of it in Spain. Um, there is an additional cost, obviously, and at the moment the quotes I've had for that are between three and 500 euros. So that is something you will have to allow for if you are a non-EU national and want to buy in certain areas of Spain. That is a new thing. Again, it's something that people are now having to deal with and the process um, is new to us because uh, we've always dealt with EU nationals buying, um, but it is something which the Spanish are practiced in. Again, so there is a system and it's a, a system that up until now has worked well. Um, right, the non-lucrative visa um, has come up again in, in terms of the finances. Um, yes, you can have a lump sum in the bank to instead of actual income. The non-lucrative visa, your residency, your initial residency is for one year, so you'd have to have one year's worth of income in the bank. Your second renewal is for two years, for years two and three, so you would need two years in the bank. Your next renewal is for years four and five, so again, you would need two years worth of income in the bank. And after that, you can apply for permanent residency at the end of five years, it gets signed over as permanent residency, and you can spend your money. So um, you don't have to prove income after that. So it, there is a way around it if you don't have a mega pension and want to retire. We are running out of time, so I'm quickly looking down the questions. If there's anything you want to ask, particularly of a more personalized to you, please email us info at spanishdreamproperty.com, info at spanishdreamproperty.com, and we will get back to you. I'll be in the office again on Monday. Um, but We'll, we'll pick up on those and deal with the sort of more personalized um, responses then, because obviously this is very general information. <laughs> so anything else? Uh, because I think we're gonna be cut off any second because we're up to time. So thank you for joining us. Um, sorry about the technical hitch and thank you for bearing with us. Thank you.